The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and good evening. I would like to welcome any new participants, as well as welcome back any previous participants joining us tonight. Before I introduce myself, I would like to open up a poll, which should display on your screen momentarily. Um, if you could please click on the response that best applies to you. I'll give you a few seconds for that. All right, and I'm going to close the poll. So it looks like joining us tonight, um, we have primarily other, um, but also 28% students, 21% clinicians, 10% administrators, and 7% educators. Um, so I'm going to open the second poll now. Okay, so it's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's Interprofessional Virtual Grand Rounds presented by the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. My name is Jessica Prokop and I'm a third year medical student at The Ohio State University College of Medicine and I'm also the AADMD Virtual Grand Rounds Medical Recruiter. So I'm going to close the second poll in a second if you would be so kind as to answer. All right, so in what stage of your career are you? Looks like 42% are currently practicing. Also 42% are health professionals in training, whether it's medical, dental school, et cetera. Um, and we also have some pre-health professions, as well as some in residency and a few who are retired as well. And I'm gonna open the final, the final poll. So AADMD virtual grand round sessions seek to create a space for mentorship and exchange of knowledge and experience between seasoned IDD providers, entry-level cl clinicians, and future healthcare providers in training. The purpose of the grand round sessions is to expand and strengthen the IDD healthcare workforce across a spectrum of experience levels. At the end of the presentation, we ask that you please stay on with us to ask any questions you have for the presenter. And questions can be submitted through the questions tab that you can find on your gray control panel on your screen. In addition, tonight's presentation can be downloaded under the handouts tab also on the gray control panel on your screen. You can use that for future reference or to follow along during the presentation. So I'm going to close the final poll now. And here are the results. What do you hope to gain from this webinar? It looks like the majority want to gain interprofessional perspectives on healthcare for individuals with IDD, um, as well as learning foundational healthcare concepts and gaining some pearls from complex and challenging clinical cases. Okay, so at the end of the session, we will send you a link to a quick survey that we've made that shouldn't take more than five minutes or so, but it's very important to us that you do fill it out. The feedback we receive through this survey allows us to improve the virtual Grand Rounds experience and also to hear what future presentations you'd like to have us organize. So with that, tonight's presenter is Dr. Cameron Jeter. Dr. Jeter received her doctorate in cognitive neuroscience from MD Anderson Cancer Center, UT Health Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. Dr. Jeter is currently an assistant professor at the University of Texas School of Dentistry at Houston. With fellowship training in clinical and translational science, Dr. Jeter's research focuses on the intersection of dentistry and neurology aiming to understand and address the unique oral health needs of populations with neurological diseases. Tonight, she will be presenting Impaired Social Cognition in Autism Spectrum Disorder. And with that, I'd like to hand the floor over to Dr. Jeter. Thank you, Jessica, and good evening to all of you who have joined me this evening. I want to thank Jessica and others of the Virtual Grand Rounds for inviting me uh, to share some of my experiences and expertise with you this evening. 
So I first want to begin by sharing the objectives that I've set forth for us while we're together for this hour. And that first is to introduce what theory of mind is and its status in patients with autism spectrum disorder. Secondly, we will consider where and when individuals with autism spectrum disorder look when they are presented with faces and particularly emotions on those faces. And then third, we will look at what we call the neural correlates of social cognition. So this basically means what the brain is doing and which parts of the brain are doing that when imaging is um, enacted during these social cognition tasks. And then finally, I want to help us consider how do we take this information and apply it to our healthcare for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. So first, let me define what social cognition is. It is so prominent in our everyday lives that it's often hard for us to identify each characteristic. For example, we orient to our surroundings, like joint attention. Shown here in this figure is a small baby that even at this young age knows that his parents are looking up into the air. And so the baby as well wants to pay attention to perhaps a balloon or a bird, something that has drawn the attention of his parents. So social cognition also helps us consider another's intentions because we follow their gaze or their body actions. And this then allows us to respond appropriately in social situations and even take turns appropriately in conversation. But social cognition also includes language and our cognitive abilities. For example, using uh, nonverbal communication, again, looking at the body language of another. Or normal um, symbolic play would be as this boy in the picture who has picked up a banana, but is not actually eating the banana as we might when it was food, but is using it like a telephone uh, handset or receiver because he has seen others use a telephone and sees similarities in the banana to the phone. Social cognition also includes literacy skills and executive functioning. So just like the CEO of a business that runs the business and makes decisions, the central executive in our brain is that that helps us plan, uh, try to meet a goal, and if there are barriers to that goal, replan, revise so that we can still meet that goal. For example, you want to go shopping at Target and your normal route is under construction. So you replan and take a detour that you've done impromptu in your mind so that you can still reach the goal of your Target run. Now I want to do the basics of defining autism spectrum disorders and you've noticed I've taken great care to say the full phrase autism spectrum disorders because that is the new terminology under the DSM-5. The figure though that I'm starting with is the definition of autism spectrum disorders previously under the DSM-4. Notice that it comes under the heading of pervasive developmental disorder and three of those conditions shown on the left, autism, Asperger disorder, and per per pervasive, excuse me, developmental disorder not otherwise specified, fall under that category of autism spectrum disorders. Other uh, pervasive developmental disorders would include Rett syndrome and childhood disintegrative disorder. But under the new DSM-5 as of 2013, uh, Rett that syndrome has been placed in a different category and autism spectrum disorders now encompasses these four conditions shown in the red box. So to summarize these diagnostic criteria that have changed over time, you'll notice in the top row, uh, I'm showing the DSM-5 domains that to be considered an autism spectrum disorder case, an individual would have troubles with social interaction, communication, and have behaviors and interests that are unusual, such as repetitive behaviors. That has been updated in 2013 under the DSM-5 
including much of the same criteria but in different categories. And you'll notice there to the far right with the addition of sensitivity to different sensory inputs and unusual interests that might be rather than playing with a Hot Wheels car and rolling it along the ground, uh, instead opening and shutting the doors carefully or spinning the wheels with great interest looking at the details of an object rather than using it for its uh, true and regular purpose. So what does all this mean practically? Well, I'm now going to show a very long list of behaviors that can be seen across individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And I should say that each individual is unique and wonderful, and it's that complexity that all often can be difficult in providing care to these individuals. So behaviors that can be considered typical of ASD would include an insistence on sameness. Individuals with ASD like a regular routine and any change from that can be disconcerting. It's also characteristic of individuals with ASD to have repetitive movements. This can be spinning in a circle, flapping one's hands, uh, so the re repetition provides some comfort. And we also know that individuals with ASD sometimes are not responsive to verbal cues or eye contact. And some of the research I'll present later helps us look at whether this eye contact uh, is because they don't look another person in the eye, uh, or if they do but don't understand that social cue. This culminates in having difficulty in social situations. Uh, many individuals with autism spectrum disorder don't understand the meaning of idioms. So if someone says, if you don't stop that, I'm going to wring your neck. And they don't understand that that's not a literal statement. They also have difficulty expressing their own needs to others. And so they can often be misunderstood and even labeled as belligerent or uncooperative. And they have deficiencies in symbolic thinking, understanding that things are not to be taken literally. I've mentioned their attachment and love of objects rather than people. And so here again is where they might be playing closely with that Hot Wheel car. Now they have sensory motor uh, deficiencies and sensitivities in addition to self-injurious behaviors and echolalia, which means copying what someone has just said. So for the healthcare provider, it can be surprising and um, confusing when the caregiver may say, and please open your mouth. And the patient would repeat back, open your mouth. One way to um, bring this echolalia down or decrease its frequency is to respond with just a one word phrase, yes. About 70% of individuals with autism spectrum disorder are also affected by an intellectual disability. And so this can just compound uh, some of the communicative deficits that we've already discussed. Let me share some um, remarks and comments from both researchers and patients with autism themselves. This is to help us understand their viewpoint. So on the topic of the desire to have sameness and a regular routine, uh, in the book um, edited by Howlin, uh, the quote here is shared, basically sharing that uh, reality to an autistic person is confusing because they don't understand their surroundings. And one way that they try to keep everything under control and to avoid a chaotic life is to insist on that sameness. Here's another individual and an adult with autism spectrum disorder, sharing that he or she became quickly overwhelmed in social situations with all of the cues, uh, and interactions that can be confusing to them. And therefore, repetitive behaviors and confusing behaviors to others without autism spectrum disorder commence. 
yet they share uh, the viewpoint that they think others experiencing life this way would do the same. I've heard some clinicians and some patients describe that having autism because of the confusing blur of people and comments and stimuli is almost like having stage fright all the time. That an individual with autism spectrum disorder is uncertain how to respond or if they really are the one to whom the communication is directed and they can't interpret what others are really meaning and they feel like they're in the spotlight all the time. This can lead to individuals with autism spectrum disorder as being described as having a short attention span, being hyperactive, easily frustrated and throwing tantrums. Well, let's now get to the social cognition part of the talk where I define theory of mind. This is one of my favorite topics within social cognition. It simply is defined as someone's ability to attribute mental states to another. And so in layman's terms, terms, that basically means that we just know the desires, intentions, and perspectives of other people and can understand that people have different opinions and beliefs than we do. This naturally develops when children are young, and so we can perform tests that determine whether a young child has yet developed theory of mind or not. Here in this fun cartoon, we see that Denzel's father is at work, talking to Denzel over the phone, and he says, what are you doing, Denzel? Denzel at home, playing with his trains, says, playing with this. But of course, Denzel doesn't yet have theory of mind to understand that his dad, although talking to him over the phone, can't see what Denzel has in his hand. So too, an individual with autism spectrum disorder will have trouble understanding that people other than themselves have knowledge different than them, the patient with autism spectrum disorder. So if theory of mind is the ability to attribute mental states, it can be said that individuals with autism spectrum disorder have mind blindness. And that term was coined uh, by Simon Baron Cohen, a great psychologist uh, who first gave that phrase in 1985. And I wanna share a quote uh, from an autistic uh, girl I know of 12 years of age where even though she was a preteen, she came in to her mother one day after school and said, hey mom, I learned today that when the eyebrows go up, the person is surprised. She had just figured that out, but it was a helpful cue to her as she learned how to interact with her world. And as you can understand, this is something usually children learn at a very young age. Even I, as I read storybooks to my young children, share a book called Goodnight Gorilla. In this book, the gorilla gets out of his zoo cage and follows the zookeeper to his home, crawling in bed with the zookeeper and his wife for a cozy night. Here is the gorilla and all the zoo animals that he has brought with him to the zookeeper's bedroom. But when the zookeeper's wife awakes and sees the gorilla in her bed and all the other animals, notice her surprise, her eyebrows go up. And so even my young two-year-old at this page in the story will gasp with surprise, just like the wife, and raise her eyebrows. So she has developed um, the expressions of emotion and theory of mind. As I mentioned, we can test someone's uh, understanding of theory of mind with specific tests called false belief tests. My favorite is the Sally Ann false belief task. Notice in the figure on the left is Sally, a little blonde girl. And here's Ann on the right, a brunette. They are playing together, having both a basket and a box. Sally takes a ball out of the basket and puts it, um, well, she has a ball and puts it into her basket, being able to hide it under the small blanket. 
In the meantime, Sally goes out for a walk, and Anne, the brunette that stays behind, takes the ball out of the basket and transfers it to the box. So the question to the individual watching this story is, now Sally comes back from her walk and she wants to play with her ball. Where will Sally first look for the ball? So the majority of us will know that Sally will look in the basket. Why? Because Sally placed the ball in the basket. And as far as she knows, no one has removed it from the basket. It is still where she left it. However, a child who has not yet developed theory of mind, and so too individuals with autism spectrum disorder, will answer, oh, Sally will look in the box. Because the small child or individual with autism spectrum disorder has seen the whole story play out, has seen Anne move the ball, and does not understand that this is information that the viewer is privy to that Sally did not know. It's very specific at about the age of three to four that a child will develop theory of mind. Let me share with us a video about two to three minutes long that will describe theory of mind. I'm gonna be clicking on the link to take us to a YouTube video and uh, we'll turn up the sound in hopes of being able to hear it. Sister, where did you put that song? I don't know, you have to find it. Okay. Kindergarten is a really exciting time. One of the developmental hallmarks in, at this age is that children develop this awareness that other people have different thoughts and feelings than they do. This is called theory of mind. Because he thought it was. He thought it was, that's right. The first test we did was this representational change booklet, which shows different animals. What's this? Um, a bird. A bird, what color is it? Blue. A blue bird, that's right. What do you see through this window? A dinosaur. And it is a? Dinosaur. A dinosaur. And then what do you see through this window here? A lion. A lion. Can you turn the page for me? And it is a? Lion. <gasps> sun. A sun. What did you think it was before I showed you? A lion. A lion. What do you think Millie will think it is before she sees it? A, a lion. What do you see there? A uh, lion. And it's a? Sun. Oh my gosh. What's inside? Morning. Okay, can you open it up for me? There's a little bit of tape there. With each child, we showed them this box of Smarties and asked what was inside. When they went to open the box, instead of Smarties, they found raisins. When I did the task with Pradmesh, he really had this understanding that his sister wouldn't know that he knew there were raisins inside the Smarties box. What do you think she'll think is inside? In the third and fourth test, we set up a few different storylines. And at the end of these storylines, we asked the children a few different questions to find out whether they really understood the perspective and thinking of the two different dolls in the yeah. stories. You want to put the ball away. They put the ball in the box. Can you open the box for me? Can you close it? Joey decides to go outside. And then May takes the ball and she puts it in the basket. And then Joey comes back inside. And where do you think he'll look for the ball? In there. In there. Why will he look in there? Because like, so where did I put the ball? And where is it really? That's right. And then Ava decided to play a trick on her brother. The theory of mind tasks we carried out with these children will help us measure their understanding of the invisible world of the mind. The fact that people have minds and that they act on the basis of what's in their minds, on what they think and not necessarily on what is reality. But while she was doing that, she didn't see that Liam was actually watching because he came back upstairs and he didn't say anything. He just saw his sister move the game from the cupboard to under the covers. But she didn't know that he was watching. So he came back in the room and where will Ava think that Liam will look for the game? Why will she think that her brother will look in the cupboard? Because. Because why? She, he knows. When you see these words, trick, no, tell, being used 
it's an indication of a child's development of theory of mind. That's right, because she tricked him, right? So in this video that I've shared, the researcher went through a variety of false belief tests with each of these children, even highlighting the Sally Ann test that I showed in the figure before. And one of my favorites is the Smarties box, where the kids will get excited to see Smarties candy, but when you open the box, they're disappointed to find its raisins inside instead. And the researcher's question to the child was, when you give this Smarties box to your sister, what will she think is inside? And the older sibling understands that the younger sister has not yet seen the raisins inside and will expect candy. Another way to test social cognition and theory of mind is through the reading the mind in the eyes task. Here is an example. Once again, from Simon Baron Cohen. It's a series of about 32 black and white photographs of different individuals' eyes and eyebrows. And the task is to identify which of the four emotions written in the four corners are expressed by the individual in the photograph. Have you decided yet? This gentleman is regretful. How about we try a few more? How about this gentleman? Is he terrified or upset? Annoyed or arrogant? In fact, he is upset. You can see his furrowed brow. And how about this lady? This one is a little harder. Is she puzzled or nervous, contemplative or insisting? The correct answer here is this woman is nervous. You can take the full test online if you want to see your performance on all 32 photographs. And you can compare your results to these. On the uh, y-axis, we have the number of correct answers, the number of emotions correctly assigned to the black and white photographs. Notice that I'm first showing the data from healthy control males, shown in blue, and healthy control females, shown in purple. Each individual circle is someone who has taken this test. And the black circle in each is showing the mean or average performance. Because the two black horizontal lines in the purple block are higher on the graph than that for the blue men, it shows that on average, women perform uh, more accurately on identifying these emotions in the photographs than do healthy men. But how is performance among individuals with autism spectrum disorder? Here we show males with autism in the red and females with autism in green. Notice that there is no difference in performance between these two genders. Once someone has autism spectrum disorder, it does not matter whether one is male or female, they perform equally in the reading the mind and the eyes task. But also notice that as expected, individuals with autism spectrum disorder perform more poorly than healthy control males and healthy control females. So we call this a double dissociation when the data as here shows that individuals uh, in the intervention group, such as the individuals with autism spectrum disorder, are different from the healthy controls in two ways. Not only is their performance on average lower, but the uh, difference by gender has disappeared. Now let's move on to the second objective of our workshop, which is to understand eye gaze patterns. What do I mean by that? We're literally measuring where an individual looks every few milliseconds. Here's a subject sitting looking at a computer screen and you can see there's almost a sound bar looking 
um, apparatus on the table that measures the eye movements of the individual. Sometimes eye tracking is head mounted as shown in these two cases. So now that we understand the methodology, let's look at the data. Here is a paper from 2002 showing four black and white photographs of different individuals. Notice that control subjects displayed in the left column focus their eyes on the eyes, nose, and sometimes mouth of the photographs. So those red squiggly lines indicate where on the picture the research subject was viewing and focusing. But compare that to individuals with autism spectrum disorder as in the right hand column. These individuals do not focus on the eyes in the photographs or even the nose or mouth primarily. Instead, they're looking at non-social areas of the face, such as the forehead or the jaw and neck. So now that we understand that in passive viewing, individuals with autism spectrum disorder don't focus on the eyes and nose, let's understand what they do in viewing social situations. So they also have abnormal social visual pursuit. This is a famous study from 2002 where researchers took different scenes from the famous movie, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and played it for individuals, both who are healthy individuals and those with autism spectrum disorder. Notice uh, that a neurotypical individual, one without autism spectrum disorder, views the movie as is depicted by the yellow visual lines. It's this triangle that's jumping between the woman and the man seated and the man almost eavesdropping in the back. And we know that the viewer has acknowledged this because they're looking at the ear of the standing gentleman in the back, understanding that he is eavesdropping this couple. The viewer with autism, however, shown with the red markings, is busy looking at the clothing and maybe the mouth of individuals. They're missing out on perhaps jealousy or romanticism that's displayed in this scene. And in another emotionally packed scene, we can see once again the neurotypical individual looking back and forth quickly between the eyes of these individuals who seem to be arguing. Whereas the viewer with autism is missing out on this key social information. How else might this play out? The lab of my advisor, uh, graduate advisor when I was in graduate school, Anne Serino, recently published a paper in Frontiers of Neuroscience, looking at both reflexive and voluntary social gaze within individuals with autism spectrum disorder. What this figure is trying to depict is a series of screens on the computer. So notice on the far left is a black square that would be the computer screen with a white circle in the center demarked as the fixation point. That's where the individual begins the trial. At a random time later, a photograph of a woman appears and notice how her eyes are askance. She's gazing off to one direction. Once her face appear, disappears at a random time later, a target, the white square, appears in the periphery. In this case, notice that the woman's gaze was to an area of space opposite of where the target later appeared. We call this the anti-gaze or an incongruent trial because her gaze is not at all predictive of where the target will appear but it would do the person better to ignore her gaze. Compare that then to the pro-gaze situation where her gaze actually does predict where the target will later appear. As you might guess, neurotypical individuals uh, are faster to look to that white square target in the pro-gaze trials when the social information of her gaze is relevant. It helps you be faster and more accurate to looking to the peripheral target. And interestingly, that is also the case for individuals with autism spectrum disorder in the pro-gaze case. 
they actually did attend to the woman's eyes and more quickly look to the target, but not in the anti-gaze case. The takeaway message here is individuals with autism spectrum disorder can attend to eyes when it's necessary, but they don't always know what to do with that social information. So thus far, we've covered what theory of mind is and how we can know where an individual with autism spectrum disorder is looking. Let's briefly look at how brain growth and development in small children with autism spectrum disorder differs from children on uh, a regular typical growth chart. Here, an individual's age is shown on the x-axis, while the entire brain volume is shown on the y-axis. Notice that we have these two different growth paths where as uh, a child with autism begins with a large brain volume, uh, but over time uh, is outpaced by their normal healthy peers. And this uh, difference in brain size and head size is mainly affecting the frontal lobes and the temporal lobe shown here in yellow and purple respectively. So I've shown that it can be a cognitive difference, an eye movement difference, and even a brain growth difference in children and adults with autism spectrum disorder. So let's bring this story all together and talk about what parts of the brain are involved. What is the social neuroscience underpinning autism spectrum disorder? Here once again is showing the left side of the brain. Our frontal regions are shown there in yellow. And different areas depicted here subserve cognitive and social functions we've discussed thus far. For example, it's the prefrontal cortex that is responsible for joint attention, noticing that someone else is looking and attending at a supposedly important object and you don't want to miss out. The medial region of the frontal lobe is responsible for theory of mind, understanding that others have different perceptions and thoughts than you do. The orbital frontal region, also in the frontal lobe, uh, responds to social reward when we are happy with our interactions with our peers. The amygdala, deep inside the temporal lobe, is the seat of emotion not only recognizing emotion in others, but being able to regulate our own. And the superior temporal sulcus, interestingly, interprets biological motion. So for example, notice in this figure that the polka dots shown in the left and the right are in the same location. And if these polka dots were to move, they could either move in a random way that seemed meaningless, or they could be made to move in a way that one could imagine is an individual walking with an assured gait, swinging her arms and having a wide step. Individuals with autism spectrum disorder are not as good at interpreting biological motion in these meaningless dots as neurotypical individuals. And the fusiform face area helps us detect faces, and even a bit of the emotions involved there too. So let's talk about two of these areas. First, the fusiform face area. In individuals who later develop autism or uh, ASD, they have decreased attention measurable by just six to 12 months of age. And when this is brain imaged later in life, there in fact is less um, activity or bold signal in the fMRI images shown from this article by Philip. And this also is not only an inability to um, understand the faces, but slowed processing of faces, not only by the patient themselves, but also by the patient's parents and infant siblings that may not yet have autism spectrum disorder or do not develop ASD. So this shows that there is a genetic component to this social cognition. 
let's look at one other brain location, the superior temporal sulcus. As I mentioned, individuals with ASD have a reduced sensitivity to biological motion, those polka dots walking as if it were a person. And this increased activity trying to understand the polka dots is not only prevalent in those with autism spectrum disorder, but but also their family members who are at a genetic risk of developing ASD. So here's a rather big table summarizing the social brain. Notice down the left-hand column are various social cognition components that we've talked about, such as joint attention. I indicate uh, by abbreviation the brain area responsible for that component and when it normally develops but also what is um, aberrant in patients with ASD. This you can inspect and uh, refer to the references in the handout that's provided in the gray box on your screen. So in closing, I want to bring all of this to practical application. How can we take what we know of social cognition in individuals with autism spectrum disorder to help us provide compassionate and even joyful care in the clinic. So let's tell a tale of an individual with autism spectrum disorder who goes to the dental clinic in one instance with a poor outcome and then later we'll talk about a better outcome. In the scenario where things don't go so well at the clinic, the patient with autism spectrum disorder and his or her parent or caregiver doesn't do any preparation or doesn't have any direction from the care provider, the healthcare provider, on things that they can do at home to help them preview or adjust to the dental clinic. And the dental providers didn't ask the parent or caregiver, what are stimuli that are adversive to your loved one? And what can we do to provide a quiet and helpful situation at the office. There also would be no practicing at the office or building up to the procedure. Instead, the patient is brought directly to the operatory chair and a procedure is attempted. Perhaps on various visits, the patient is met by different staff, different personnel, and at different days and times. And if you remember, sameness is important for those with ASD. And the individual or patient is given strict directions, sit in this chair, not in that chair, hold still. And there's no room for helping the individual avoid overwhelming stimuli such as loud music and other patients and the adjacent drill, uh, perhaps the uh, bright fluorescent light shining in his or her eyes. And there's no attempt to help the individual adapt to this environment. So there's no behavior management. So for example, for the typical uh, pediatric patient in the dental clinic, a dentist may actually use the tell, show, do behavioral method, meaning they might show them the dental mirror, uh, tell them about it, show them how they will put it in their mouth, and then they actually do that. But this tell, show, do method is often ineffective in individuals with autism spectrum disorder because it requires joint attention. You must see that the dentist is talking specifically about an object and that the two of you should look at this object together to understand that this message is about the dental mirror. Another behavioral management technique sometimes used is voice control where when a child is in, um, uncooperative, the dental care provider can use an authoritative voice with a serious facial expression. But once again, individuals with autism spectrum disorder are not going to be as good discerning the emotion both on the face and in the voice of their care provider. And then also positive reinforcement can be helpful but must be given in the right way and at the right time. So this is the example of inappropriate reinforcement. While we might say good job or give stickers and small toys to children at the end of their dental appointment, 
these might be at a time too far um, into the future for the individual with autism spectrum disorder, and they don't associate the reward with the appropriate behavior. They don't know what they're being rewarded for. And even the wording of good job may be meaningless to them unless it is directly linked to the desired behavior of sitting still or opening his or her mouth. In some cases, confusion and misunderstanding can lead up to um, a child's parent and um, provider to choose restraint or general anesthesia for procedures. And there are cases where this may be considered appropriate, but there is much that can be done to avoid these um, procedures in this way. Let's next go through the better outcome, a story of how it happened at a different dental office. Here, there was health practice and caregiver visits to the patient's home. So the family and the caregiver should be given homework assignments. Let the caregiver place a dental mirror in the mouth of their loved one with autism spectrum disorder. And the whole goal is so that the patient is comfortable having the dental mirror or the feeling of gauze in their mouth and that the caregiver can complete oral hygiene on the patient's back molars. Once that's reliable and accomplished, then either a dental assistant or a dental hygienist from the patient's dentist's office can come make home visits and work towards successful oral hygiene. This can actually be reimbursed through the Medicare Title 19 home and community-based waiver program. There is a clause that allows for personal care services. So a dental office and the family can contact uh, the patient's um, case manager who will authorize these personal care services to be provided at home. And that will pay for the dental assistant or hygienist to come to the home of the individual with autism spectrum disorder so that this bond of trust that was developed when the caregiver brushed the teeth of their loved one, it's now transferred to the dental assistant and hygienist. This may take many different visits, but is an important part in developing rapport and mutual respect. Even um, different physical cues can be practiced at home. Tapping the patient on the forehead to indicate they should open their mouth. And initially you would give them a bite of food, but over time they would have a dental mirror placed in their mouth. But once again, the tapping of the forehead needs to be positively reinforced that every few times you do that, even in the dental clinic, uh, you give uh, the patient a bite or food. The dental hygienist will also interview the caregiver to figure out what triggers the patient. Is it loud noises or is it a scratching tag that bothers them greatly or bright lights such that that can be changed? And you allow for adjustment period at the office. Perhaps some of the last stages of the work at home is the dental hygienist or assistant doing a scavenger hunt around the house with the patient that has ASD. And so too, when you arrive at the office at a quiet Friday afternoon, the hygienist again is doing a scavenger hunt around the clinic with the patient. This may need to happen as many as eight, nine, even 10 times. And at the end of those times, now the dentist is joining in the scavenger hunt, once again, transferring that bond of trust. And in this story, as I've told you, it's the same uh, beloved dental hygienist or assistant that is welcoming the patient to the dentist office. Once they're comfortable in the office, you let them choose the seat and play with the light and squirt the air so that they see that this is a pleasant environment. And you'd invite them to come, as I mentioned, on a Friday afternoon when it's more quiet, there's no crowding or bright lights. And this tailored behavioral management would be, as I uh, described, where you'd be aware uh, that tell, show, do, and voice control may not be appropriate for children or adults with autism spectrum disorder.
then if you do give timely reinforcement, such as uh, giving back to the patient their beloved object, that Hot Wheel car that they love to have with them, they get that back in their hand as a reward for um, learning how to be uh, a proper dental patient. And then if there is the need of use to help the patient calm and uh, be still in the chair, it can also work well to have a lead apron placed on the patient. Uh, some practitioners I've spoken to said they actually have had better luck uh, with lead aprons that are um, upholstered with corduroy rather than the cold, clammy feeling of the plastic lead apron. So how would you be able to determine on your own what is going wrong here and how can I fix or change what I'm doing in my medical or dental practice to accommodate and work alongside the patient with ASD? Just remember the ABCs. What was the antecedent? What happened before this undesirable behavior of the tantrum or disrobing? And what is that behavior? And what emotion is it trying to express on the behalf of the patient? Are they fearful? Uh, is there, are they overstimulated? And what is the consequence or the change that you will make? Perhaps you'll understand or realize that the patient does not like having people hover over them in the operatory. Instead, you'll take a more humble, um, distant stance of squatting and being at eye level or below the individual who is in the dental chair. Now we've come to the conclusion of my remarks and I just want to say that there is hope for autism spectrum disorder, even just awareness in our communities. Uh, I want to draw your attention to two different characters in um, movies and stories of late. Billy being a character with autism spectrum disorder in one of the recent Power Rangers movies, uh, being an adolescent. And then here's sweet little Julia, uh, a character on Sesame Street uh, that has autism spectrum disorder. I'd love to have questions, uh, not only during the remainder of our time together during the webinar, but if you'd like to contact me after tonight, uh, feel free to do that here at my contact information. So thank you for your attention. And if there's any questions, I'd love to continue the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Jeter, for an excellent presentation. Um, I thought it was especially interesting that you were able to apply um, a lot of these cognitive um, neuroscience theories to uh, clinical practice, which I really appreciated that, especially as a learning medical student. Um, at this time, if anyone has questions, please enter it into the gray question or to the gray control panel. I believe a few of you found this already. Um, so far, it looks like a few questions are coming up asking for some clarification about um, the HCB waiver. Yes, certainly. Um, so this is the home and community-based waiver that allows um, individuals to live at home rather than institutions in their state. Different states have um, different waiting lists. Uh, so my home state of Texas has a very long waiting list of individuals who would like to take advantage of some of this home care. The personal care um, is approved through the case manager uh, assigned to the family and it can pay for someone to come into the home and do personal care such as haircuts and clipping nails and brushing teeth and so that can be uh, the reimbursement to the um, dental hygienist who can perhaps on a Friday afternoon visit three or four homes of patients with autism spectrum disorder that once ready will go to the dental hygienist's dental clinic for care. Um, since I'm not a clinician, I'm not extremely familiar with that process, but I do know it's available uh, and has been taken advantage of by a variety of private dentists who have that desire uh, to care for patients. Um, and it 
Thank you for that explanation. And it looks like um, Dr. Frey also commented and wanted to make yes. sure um, that people understood that um, the dental assistant for them to go out into the homes and receive compensation, it looks like they would need to be specifically hired by a community provider to be a, a waiver, to be certified um, for the waiver personal care. I don't know if I explained that correctly. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe so. All right. And let's see, we have some additional questions coming in. Um, one says, I've heard many different terms being used in studies when comparing an individual with ASD to an individual without ASD, such as healthy or neurotypical. What do you believe to be the proper term for this? Well, if you paid attention and listened, I first started in my talk using the word healthy because uh, I am normally doing research in other neurological populations besides ASD. And in those studies where I'm perhaps uh, describing individuals with Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, many of the studies in the research will use the term healthy control. But within uh, the realm of IDD, intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, more and more um, individuals in the literature are using the word neurotypical uh, to say that not wanting to imply that individuals with autism spectrum disorder are not healthy. In a sense, they are healthy. They just have a different um, neurotypical outlook. All right, another question. Um, do speech impairments commonly show up in children with ASD? And are there particular ones that show up more frequently than in the neurotypical population? Mm -hmm. So that can affect some um, children with ASD uh, going along with their trouble communicating. And of course, uh, you may be aware that Individuals with autism spectrum disorder can still be uh, considered on a long continuum. Um, previously, high functioning individuals with autism were referred to as having Asperger's syndrome, all the way down to low functioning individuals. Although this terminology is not used uh, under the new DSM-5 standards, there still is a continuum of individuals. And so um, my whole point is those that are considered low functioning are also often um, nonverbal. And those are the patients that are most difficult to care for. One of those um, speech differences I mentioned is the desire for these individuals to repeat what others have said, echolalia. Okay, and we have a few more questions. Um, is seeking the uh, special certification for the dental assistant to care for patients at home a pursuit of the dentist or doctor in charge of a practice to present to the assistant? Or would the responsibility fall upon the assistant themselves to become certified and employed by a community service? Looks like we have a lot of interest in this topic. Mm -hmm. And I'm very glad that there's a lot of interest because this is an excellent way to help uh, individuals with autism spectrum disorder and any other um, IDD adjust to the clinic. I'm not certain on the details. Um, I'm sure that both the dentist or the dental hygienist can begin that process. Of course, it would need um, to go through the case manager that can help direct the hygienist or assistant through that certification program. Um, and this would be of benefit to the dentist because it's helping prepare the patients who come to the clinic. Um, I'll be sure to have, um, I'll be in contact with AADMD and Dr. Frey, the current president, to make sure that we're able to disseminate how this is possible. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Do we have any additional questions at this time? Right, it looks like uh, Dr. Frey contributed as well and says, the community provider and dentist should discuss with the case manager. The HCBS waiver does not pay directly to the dentist or hygienist, and also it varies by state. Thank you for that, Dr. Frey. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we can take a few additional questions if there are any others at this time. Okay, it looks like that might be it. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending, especially Dr. Jeter. Thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to be with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, if anybody comes up with further questions, Dr. Jeter, Jeter's email is on the screen. Um, you can feel free to reach out um, to us as well. And um, you should all be receiving the survey that I mentioned earlier. And if you could take some time to fill it out, I would really appreciate that. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Jeter. Thank you for inviting me.